it is a big pleasure to welcome you to this event today. Uh, uh, it will be ta it take place in two afternoons here in Paris. It is designed this way to accommodate our uh, colleagues and friends from the other side of the Atlantic, so the friends uh, listening up. These two days are dedicated to a workshop to bring together people that are interested in the preservation of software as a cultural heritage of our past generations. And before starting the event, I would just like to thank the many institutional organizations and people that made this possible. So we are hosted today in a beautiful setting by the University of Sorbonne University. That will be a, a great address. The work we have been doing as a software heritage was in collaboration with UNESCO, and we are very grateful for them for, to them for actually allowing us to do this kind of collaboration. In collaboration with the Archive of Pisa, which is very close to my heart because it is where I learned about computer science many years ago, and I had one of my former professors that made the trip to come here on this occasion. Uh, we are particularly grateful to INRIA, who is uh, uh, hosting software heritage today, and to INRIA Foundation, which is helping us managing the, the uh, availability funding grants, etc. Uh, at last but not least, I would like to give a big thank you to Moran, who spent an incredible amount of time organizing <laughs> the settings, and Elisabetta, who has been working for us, and I hope she will continue working with us uh, to actually make these stories run. And all the people that answer positively to our call to participate together in this event, to share ideas, experience, potential future collaboration on how we should take care of our software heritage. Having said that, I think I need to eclipse myself and giving the word to other people. But first of all, some organizational point, I do ask all the people watching us online, please keep your microphone muted. If you have questions, please make them uh, available in the chat. So there will, people, there will be people here that compile the question and uh, provide them to the speakers. There will be recording available. And uh, I hope this will be a really productive event. So, first of all, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Paxton Banda, who is Chief Officer of the Memory of the World Department at UNESCO. And Paxton, we are, we are very happy that you found the time to be with us today. Uh, th th thank you so much, uh, Roberto. Um, well, I'll be making a few. Uh, remarks as I welcome you to uh, this event, uh, the first of its kind, I understand, the swap days. Uh, and in so doing, um, I want to say a few words about the Memory of the World program. Um, uh, and, and then I will try to locate our relationship with INRIA and other partners with respect to this project. Uh, within the framework uh, of what we call the 2015 recommendation concerning the preservation of and access to documentary heritage, including in digital form. And I'll be saying uh, one or two words with respect to that. Uh, but in a nutshell, the Member of the World program was, uh, was set up in 1992 uh, as a vehicle underpinned um, by three objectives, uh, the first of which uh, it, it was to identify documentary heritage, particularly of, of uh, historical significance. Uh, the second of which uh, was to preserve that documentary heritage. And the third one to ensure universal access to it. Um, and now, as I said, uh, you know, these three objectives um, are, are given their uh, affirmation, if you will, uh, in this 2015 uh, recommendation, and I, I, I have put in bold and, 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 and italicized, including in digital form, uh, uh, because that addresses the aspect of digital uh, heritage where we could uh, conceivably uh, locate um, uh, legacy software. But of course, we do understand uh, that there is uh, analog um, uh, code as well. 
uh, with that um, uh, one or two words with respect to the uh, 2015 recommendation, what exactly does it do uh, for your uh, uh, sake? Um, I, I suppose uh, the following five areas captured in terms of in terms of single words uh, might be useful, might indeed speak uh, to what we do. As, as memory of the world. Uh, obviously, uh, the first one, the second one, and the third one speak to the objectives of the, in the program, as I have already uh, highlighted them. Uh, add to that uh, the other two, policy and cooperation, and you have uh, something of an enabling uh, framework within which the three objectives play themselves out identify documentary heritage, uh, preserve it, uh, enhance universal access, it, access to it. Um, how do you do that? You do need to have an enabling policy environment. You do need to have an enabling uh, environment in which you can promote uh, cooperation, not only nationally, but also internationally. And so uh, uh, in, in, in concluding my welcome remarks then, um, how would we position uh, legacy software uh, uh, within the framework of the, 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 the 2015 recommendation. Well, with respect to identification, quite clearly this speaks uh, to what uh, this project is about, which is uh, collecting and curating uh, legacy code. With respect to preservation, yes, archiving, uh, in a way does contribute uh, towards preservation uh, by way of, of, of swap, you know, software uh, uh, heritage uh, acquisition process that I'm sure you'll be introduced to and is detailed uh, on, on the website created um, uh, for the papers, uh, but also access um, the question of displaying uh, um, um, a source code, including through software stories, which we are supporting um, uh, uh, financially uh, with the help of Huawei, uh, is indeed one way of enhancing universal access uh, to software source code, in a sense, democratizing access uh, to it as it were. Uh, but also uh, in terms of policy, we would arguably say that uh, this is about looking at the institutional policy of organizations uh, that are that are uh, involved in the business of uh, of generating software source code and indeed even uh, memory institutions um, that simply archive it um, and so on and so forth but also at the national level uh, what kind of uh, policy uh, you know you know frameworks are in place uh, that speak uh, to the uh, identification of source code where Whatever it might be, uh, supporting developers uh, of, 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 of such code, uh, linking it uh, to, to, to academic research uh, as the need might be, uh, how uh, um, uh, uh, corporations uh, handle it, the question of, um, of, of access and so on and so forth. All those uh, uh, questions uh, that policy uh, might touch on. Uh, and also at the international level, uh, you've got principles that are set out uh, uh, in, in documents such as the 2015 recommendation itself. And an important point to make there is that uh, UNESCO's member states uh, every four years report on their implementation of the 2015 recommendation. And what we require of them is to include aspects of, uh, of, 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 of software source code in the questionnaire and the extent uh, to which um, they are working uh, with that. The same applies to cooperation operation at the institutional level across uh, all memory institutions. And I think initiatives of this sort are helping with that. Uh, again, um, to what extent um, are member states uh, supporting uh, supporting national cooperation uh, on, on, on these issues as well as international cooperation? Uh, is this providing the kind of environment that can uh, support the thriving uh, of not only the development of source code, but also uh, the identification of it, including uh, its, uh, its archiving? Uh, these are issues you know, that we think uh, we can uh, work on as UNESCO in cooperation with uh, uh, organizations like INRIA. And so we are very, very happy be very proud to be associated with a project of this sort, and we will continue to offer it whatever support uh, uh, we can institutionally and in collaboration with others. Uh, and so let me, uh, on that note, uh, um, uh, say thank you uh, for participating and a special welcome uh, to all of you. 
Over to you. Well, thanks a, a, a lot, Paxson, for this introduction. Actually, for making the transition so easy for me, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Patrick Pitzinger, who is advisor on open science to the president of the University of Tobago University. And we are very happy that you have the time to welcome us to the program. Thank you, Roberto. I will be very brief. Uh, just to welcome you on behalf of Natalie Lachtemann, uh, Southern University's president. Um, just to remind that we are supporting software research for several years here in Southern University. Uh, this is a full part, fully part of our open science policy. And we are supporting software research financially, but also uh, to, to make it known by the scientific communities and especially uh, through the work of our two ambassadors, software ambassadors. So um, just uh, let me thank you again, Roberto and Software Heritage for organizing this meeting today. And thanks to Fabrice Cordon and the Lipsy also for the invitation. Good work. Thank you. So Fabrice, come, come to the floor. I'm very happy to uh, give the floor to Fabrice Cordon, who is director of the Lipsy Laboratory of uh, Computer Science here at the Sorbonne University. And that actually you were very involved in the 75 years of computing in France. Yes, in initiative. <laughs> and yeah. thanks a lot again for the organization and the support in this technology. Uh, so uh, I just, just uh, two words for, for us in France. Uh, this is, in fact, it was last year, but due to the COVID crisis, we had to push that uh, one year forward. But uh, we were trying to uh, celebrate the uh, 75 years of computer science in France. And we put as a starting date, I have a historian in front of me, so I have to be very careful. The creation of the first Institut Blaise Pascal it, uh, in, in uh, Faculty of Science of the University of Paris at that time. So this is for us the starting point, uh, but uh, we can have lots of discussion about that. Uh, also, uh, we are very happy to, to host, to, to help hosting uh, this uh, workshop in our university uh, because uh, Libre software, I like to use the word libre as a, uh, Richard uh, uh, prefers to, to, to use it, uh, is a part of the ADA, of the DNA, sorry, of the Lipsis. Uh, in fact, uh, we are uh, really involved in doing softwares. As I meant, I have always said as a director of Lipsis, we like theorems, but we also like theorems that works. And to be sure that theorem works, uh, it's a good way to create softwares. Sometimes this also raises interesting technical and scientific problems because we have to solve uh, algorithmic issues that are not totally trivial to uh, have uh, our theories uh, applicable. And so uh, this is why it was really, uh, we were really happy uh, to co-organize, uh, to uh, coordinate the workshop with the Software Heritage and UNESCO. Uh, in uh, the Corpus Pierre and Marie Curie of Sorbonne University. Thank you very much. After this introduction, just a few words about what we do at Software and why we are involved in organizing events like this one. Uh, so maybe a little bit of introduction here. Uh, we do see software as part of our cultural heritage. I've been seeing doing software for a long time. When I was a student many, many years ago, you can see the date here, it goes back a certain number of decades. I will use the book by Professor Ard Adelson where in the introduction it was written, the software is written for people to read and only accessorily for machines to execute. Or as Donna Knuth, who is another of the founding people of computer science, uh, we can also say that programming is the art of telling another human being what we want the computer to do. Okay? It is not just a tool or an app on your phone. It's much more than that. It's deeper than that. Software doesn't come out of the book. It's written by people. Actually, we say we write in computer software. And when we, this was said many years ago, maybe it was not very clear, but today we have the ability to see an incredible amount of open source software that allows us to see what happens in behind the running program, we see the source code. You see, for example, this is a beautiful excerpt of the source code that was running on the Apollo 11, 
landing uh, uh, module. And actually, we have the privilege and the pleasure today of welcoming the person, Rolf Zarte, who actually spent an incredible amount of time of energy to bring this to us and make it accessible to us. And you see in this old code on the left, you see the machine code, which is not very readable unless you are a computer scientist, so it will take some time to look at manual. But on the left, you see the comment after the number sign, these are written in English, can be very readable for everybody, and you can actually understand what is going on. And this was not just the case for programming language which are pretty old, like uh, uh, this one, but if you move forward a bit, some, some 30 years, this is an excerpt of an incredible routine that is part of the Quake 3 Arena uh, source code, one of the ancestors of Call of Duty. If you have kids in the team area, you know what I mean. I mean, they spend too much time trying to kill everything that moves on the screen. But I mean, behind this, there are routines like this one where also there you see comments and names and variables, et cetera, which are important to understand what is going on. So as Len Schustek, who was a board director of the Computer History Museum, and again, today we have the privilege and the pleasure to welcome speak a speech by David Bach from the Computer History Museum. Uh, he wrote in a beautiful paper in 2006, the access to the source code of the program provides us in, with, with a window in the mind of the designer. And this is something we need to remember. So you see this importance of the source code was not well known, I, I mean, outside our community knows it very well. And in 2019 already at UNESCO, there was a meeting convened with 40 experts around the world sitting down and writing this document, this call, uh, on the importance of source code for society as a whole. Okay, and inside this document, you find in particular, one of the many calls, a call to actually take advantage of the possibility of rebuilding the history of landmark source code while the original creator are still around. And uh, more recently, you can find a beautiful article in, in I don't remember if it was a program in the 2021 edition of uh, the communication of the ACM, written by Donald Knut and Len Schuster, saying that actually we, it is so important to the rebuild the history behind programs because there is no better way of teaching the younger generation what is happening, even in a technical thing, than by telling stories. And the other important point is that we have the privilege in our discipline, in our field, to be still able to talk to the creators. I have friends in physics that would love to talk to Newton, but it is too late. I have friends in mathematics that would love to talk to Leibniz or Newton, of course, but it is too late. But here in our discipline, we can still, but the clock is ticking, talk to the people who actually created all this. So you see, this is the reason why we started getting engaged in this because we are part of the mission, a tiny part of the big community that is trying to address this mission, but we were focused on some particular issues. So when you want to preserve the source code for the long term, how can you do that? Well, there are different ways. In the past, in the 70s, we put source code on an FTP server, a file transfer protocol server with the TAR-GZ, no, GZ, it doesn't exist at the moment, I mean, TAR or whatever, etc. Uh, then with the web, we forgot about FTP and we put everything on web pages. Then somebody tried to put this in document system, probably sticking a digital object identifier on top of it. I mean, this is what was done before. Okay. Then later on, end of the 90s, beginning of the 20, uh, 2000, we started using collaborative host, uh, code hosting platforms to develop software collaborative. I mean, they forge, source forge, et cetera which are much more agreeable. You can see the code, you can comment it, you can click on it. It is much better than just downloading an archive file and try to inspect it. And this has become very popular. And then more recently, if you look in open science, in the publication area, people do not know yet exactly how to do all this because we, we had a mix of things. I mean, this is from the ACM. I, I, I strike it out the name of the people because I don't, do not want to blame everybody, but you will see, it is a tar file with a DOI, but the author tried to smuggle in the link to the form because this is a way you can actually see that. I mean, it's not optimal. So the situation today is that the old way, I mean, the old way of using web pages is not really user friendly. The new way the tar forges is more user friendly, but it has a, has a bunch of limitations. And so let me say, what are these limitations? Is that a lot of people put software on code hosting platform, but code hosting platforms are not archives. 
We have seen in 1995, almost 1 million projects unplugged when Google Code and GitHub was shut down. This is continued today. So in 2019, uh, Mercury, uh, Vitorius, uh, sorry, Bitbucket, which is another consulting company, removed all the reports of a million of projects because they stopped supporting a particular version of the system. This summer, GitHub.com, which is another popular platform, considered removing all the projects that didn't have at least one activity in the last year. You know, it makes sense. So, even, so to make a long story short, if you want an archive, you need an archive. Now you should need to look on the box what is written. If it is not written archive, it is not an archive. Well, the good news is that now, and this is the reason why we are here in this room today, we are building one, one archive for software. This is where software Edge comes in. This initiative started in 2015. So we are seven years old today to support from India, also the Université, collaboration with UNESCO and many others. And we are trying to build this universal catalog of software, a universal archive, and also a platform to actually explore how software is developed. It is a common infrastructure. It is not the company, it is a non-profit, non-tech organization that tries to provide a single infrastructure serving the needs of many. And we already archive proactively over 180 million projects from all around the world. And we actually base everything we do on openness and different kinds of principles to ensure this is the service of mankind and not just of software. Uh, this is supported by UNESCO. So again, thanks a lot to UNESCO and supported by many organizations, but thanks to India, so and many others here. And now, why is this relevant for the discussion of today? Because software heritage today provides the way of having an archive for all kinds of source code. We are actually proactively archiving software source code, which is available around, but we also provide means of adding curated source code. And then the other point is that we provide also specific identifiers designed for software. We didn't invent them. We are either based on the technology which is widespread today, you know, pictographic hashes, that allow to have persistent identification of software components. Now, I do not have the time now to show it, but you will see on the slide, which are already online, you can click on the blue link and all this. You can compare what could be done by using the old kind of technology, I mean, links to URLs, and what can be done by using links into software heritage, and you will see the big difference. I mean, articles, beautiful articles about the, the uh, Apollo 11 source code published in 2016, they have a lot of links out already inside. The blog post we published a, a little bit uh, later has links to software that stay there because they are cryptographic. Yes. Now to, to end this introduction, so we consider ourselves as software editor just a tiny piece in a big puzzle that everybody is trying to build in this room and online. And so we are here to provide archival and reference. But there is much more that needs to be done. We need to rebuild the story. We need to actually make them accessible. We need to provide tools to historians to actually do this in an agreeable way. So our goal today is to humbly contribute a few of the things that we did as software heritage to improve the, the work that has been done up today. And we present some of them today. But overall, bring together many people interested in this issue with the hope to see a renewed effort to collaborate, to work together, to actually speed up in this effort to rebuild in the history while people are still alive. And I would like just to say, we will end this with an old African saying that I, the people in my team hear me saying it all and all over again. Uh, it is not just assets of heritage, it's not just India, it is not just the people that are hosting us, it is a global issue. If we want to proceed, we need to work together. Okay, yes, alone I can go faster because I do not need to coordinate to go to data from these people. But together we go farther. We are more powerful and we can produce that. So I would like to end here and just uh, welcome everybody and hope that this will be a very productive uh, workshop. And I give the floor back to Elisabetta and for the rest of the class. Thanks a lot for the